one drum to pitiless waves. It's all that we see or see, but a dream within a dream. Edgar Allan Poe. However, the dream that we will focus on today is a dream a vision that became an iconic symbol. That iconic symbol is Mount Rushmore. Whose dream was it? It wasn't Edgar Allan Poe. No. It was a gentleman by the name of Don Robinson. Robinson was a state historian for the state of South Dakota. His dream was to bring more tourists to the state of South Dakota. His dream was not president whatsoever. Robinson had a saying that tourists soon get tired of scenery unless it has something of interest to impress you. And you and I know that there is some truth to that. Now, what did he want to do to get a tourist here? Well, he wanted to carve statues into what is known as the needles here in South Dakota. But it was not of those four presidents. It was of relevant figures that the people of the Dakotas could relate to. The Lakota leaders, Crazy Horse, Red Cloud, Lewis E. Clark, John Fremont, Buffalo Bill Holmes, and others. He dreamed that they would carve statues of those individuals in the spires of so, that is the dream. You would think that everyone would be on board. However, you know that anytime someone has a plan, that there's some opposition to it. And there was opposition to Robinson's plan. Yes, there was. And that's what makes this story so dramatic is that he pushed forward because he wanted some reality from that In 1924, he took this idea to a friend of his, Peter Norback. And Norback signed on and says, great. However, whoever does it must be more in a car. So, Robinson gets in contact with the guy with a lot of experience with doing the stuff. No, it was not Guts and Barker. It was a gentleman by the name of Loreto Taft out of Chicago. He contacted Taft and he said, I have this business. This is what I would like to do. Taft replied, great, however, I can't do it. I'm too old, I'm ill, and I can't travel to South Dakota. And so he then says, I know a guy who can do this for you. And he recommended Guts and However, Barkman already has done it. Uh, something. 
Confederate leader, and Robert E. Lee Stonewall Jackson, and others. So, he then makes a trip to South Dakota because Mr. Robinson invited him here. He took a look at one, took a look at the needles. And he said, Don, great idea, but I can't carve them. They are too wet. Nature has already weathered her into what she wanted her to be. And so he leaves and goes back to Stone Mountain, Georgia, to his job. Of course, there was always a conflict between Parkland and the daughters of the Confederates. Excuse me, people in the back. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yes, my supervisor is back there, but I'm going to ask you all just for a little bit of time and courtesy. Uh, I'm trying to do a program, and quite frankly, it's irritating. So, he goes back. The daughters knew they had been to South Dakota. And so they said, the audacity of you to leave the job that we're paying you for to go to South Dakota. They were already upset at him because of his management and funds and because of his ego. And so they decided to part ways with him. They were fired. Upon being fired, he destroyed the model that he had been commissioned to do. Kicked them down off the mountain, totally destroyed them. The law enforcement on his tail, he escapes to North Carolina. I guess being unemployed has a way of motivating us all because he then contacts Robinson and said, I'll make a second trip to South Dakota. However, there must be some uh, stipulation. We have to find a mountain that's big enough that towers above all other mountains. Number two, the mountain must face in a certain direction. And that direction was southeast. Southeast because if you take a look out at that structure now, you will see something beaming off of it, the sun. And so the sun would touch that structure almost every day of the year. And so after riding around several years on our back, they come upon this magnificent mountain. 5,276 feet above the sea level. And he said, this is it. It's all enough, it's facing the right direction. So now you have a mountain, now you have a man who's going to do it. The next thing that you need is money. To start off, donation, yeah. Norbert, William Williamson, goes to Congress to secure funding for this. Congress agreed a dollar for dollar match up to $250,000. A dollar for dollar match is not good business because if you only raise $500,000, Congress only have to give you $500,000 one of the additional reasons that it took so long to do this structure, 14 years, because they constantly was running out of money. When they started this thing in October of 1927, they worked two months and they were out of money. They were out of money. So they had to come up with another plan. They go into the schools 
And they ask little children to put money in cans on the teacher's desk, the pennies, the dimes, the quarter. They raised about seventeen hundred plus dollars. Certainly, that was not enough money. So, Mr. Norback and Mr. Williamson go back to Congress with the support of uh, President Coolidge. They then decide to fund this particular stuff that became known as Mount Rush. So now you have everything in place. You have a mountain. You have a guy who's capable of doing it. You've secured the necessary fund. You need a labor force. Excellent labor force right in this area because you have men who work as hard rock miners. And so they were familiar with tools that they knew in doing this stuff. So he had the labor force right here in the area. There were mechanics, and they needed mechanics to go. If the winches would malfunction, the mechanics had the responsibility of repairing them. There were carpenters, because the carpenters had to build latrines, scaffolds, and everything else. And they needed blacksmith, because the blacksmith would have the responsibility of refurbishing the drills that they used all day long and carving on that mountain. Then they had cowboys, boys that would sit on the top of the mountain and yell back and forth and communicate to the witchmen and the drillers. And I mentioned drillers because drillers were very, very important in this job. They probably was the third most important occupation on this project. The most important one was the individuals that they called pointers. The pointers were, those, were the individuals who were responsible for doing the measurements on the models that had been created by law. They used a tool like this one, as you see on President Lincoln's head, with the plumb fall on the tractor, a straight edge. Now these gentlemen were called pointers because they measured the different points of the face. Top of the head, the nose. Top four, the nose is from the face. Top of the head to the chin. The angle of the cheekbone. So these guys were very important. And they were the ones who primarily was responsible for the drillers and the explosive men being good at that job. A lot of people say that Barkley went up and he did all of this. No, his pointers did that. And he only worked with three of them. One of the three was his son, Lincoln. The pointer, every time Barkley would change something, they had to redo the measurement. Now this is the original model, number nine. There were not nine models, one model, eight different revisions, this is the ninth one. And so, that's how many times the pointers had to change the measurements for the men working on top of the mountains. He used a one to 12 ratio. One to 10. Down on the ground would be equivalent to one foot on a mountain. A one to 12 ratio. His model, five feet tall. Five feet times 12, six hits each of the president's face. From head to chin, it's approximately 60 feet tall. The pointers were very, very important. 
Once the pointers did all of their measurements, and there were many of them, they then would go to the top of the mountain and use the red paint, first of all, not dark on the but the point. And they would point, they would place the paint where they wanted the drillers to drill to remove the surface rock. Now, it's a misconception that the men see explosive men just blew up things. No. No. These men were actually sculptures themselves. Once the pointer dictated where they wanted them to go up, the drillers would drill holes in the mine. Starting off approximately eight had the responsibility of removing that surface rock. However, in removing that surface rock, it had to be removed so that the head of uh, George Washington would be shaped like an egg. So they just didn't blow off the rock for the sake of blowing it off. And using the explosive, as I said, they were structured themselves. They, the explosive men, were responsible for the shape of those four heads. And the egg shaped Then the pointers would go back after taking measurements and once again red paint. And then that's where a group of people came in known as the car. Carvers would come in using the drill, but this is connected to the compressor, and they would sit in a molten chair like that, and then they would begin to carve approximately two inches apart in that beaming hot sun. And in that carving, what they was doing, they was doing the process that we call
hundred years from now, I can't tell you what the faces will look like. But right now, those are the same faces that was completed way back in 1941. The same. They were power washed back in 2005. Okay, if they need sealing, the fracture, the sealing people will go up and seal them so that the marshal and the water will stay out. It is said that the current peak granite only erodes about one inch every 10,000 years. Hence, that's where the thing comes from, a hundred thousand years. That structure will be here when all men's skyscrapers are gone, when the pier is gone. But these four presidents that represent 150 years of U.S. history, from the beginning, through the expansion, through the preservation, and pushing this country out into the forefront of being the world power, they will be here and outlast anything else on the earth. So here in Mount Rushmore, we like to say what we have out there they finished, but unfinished product. The structure is not as this model is because of two reasons. Mr. Barclay passed away in March of 1941 after having surgery. He didn't die from the surgery, but from a complication later. And federal funding ran out in 1941. Of World War II was looming. We were not involved in the war at the time, but we were supporting the war effort. That's why we have what we have out there now a finished, but unfinished product. A dream, a dream, a vision that became an iconic Thank you very much for your time. And I, uh, do apologize.